Hey everyone, today's episode is with Mater Nan Webster. Um, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's also very experienced in um, Kundalini yoga and meditation and breath work. So she's combining those two today and explaining her concepts behind her latest book called The Stressless Brain. Um, she gets into the difference between the mind and the brain. And man, like things that are so affected by meditation. She's actually she's blending some of of the ancient wisdom with the latest research and science, which you guys know I'm a fan of. And I think you are too, if you, if you listen to this podcast. Um, and it's so interesting because she's backing up, like what does breath work and meditation actually do to the brain, uh, physically, you know? And so that's so interesting. She's getting into glandular function, our pineal gland and how that affects our stress levels, the vagus nerve, but like what's actually going on there. Um, and she's does such a great job teaching the, the kind of the Western and Eastern approach is um, so, so good. I know you guys are going to love this episode, so I'm going to go ahead and just let her jump right into it. Here is Mater Nan Webster. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more or REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again. And also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away. And I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios. Right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it, guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting, and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about higher coaching. This is my coaching system and I get a lot of questions because, um, it's not just training and nutrition. We do that. I love training and nutrition, obviously, but we also do more. We do personal development and the way that's delivered is a 90 day personal development program that you go through with me when you work with me. So it's a video course with questions for you to deep dive in yourself for the first 90 days of working with me. Now that comes as part of a morning routine. I am really big on the morning routine and you ask any of my clients, I will push you on that because it's life changing. So we start with meditation and then we do gratitude and then that personal development program. Um, that's our deep dive psychologically. And after the 90 days, you go to the next level, you start doing what I'm doing currently. And it's a lot of strategic goal setting and it's really, really honestly, miraculous what's happening, not only in my life, but in my clients lives. Like it brings me to tears when I get on calls with them. I'm like, do you see yourself? Like, do you see what you're doing? That is so cool. So anyway, that is um, for me, the bread and butter of my coaching. I love it so much. Um, also though, in, in regards to your body, I also like to go deep dive and see what might be holding you back. So that's where all the biohacking side comes in. We do a physiological deep dive as well. So we do blood testing, hair mineral testing, DNA testing, body composition, aura ring. Um, so your heart rate variability, your sleep cycles. Do you have any deficiencies? Do you have issues with sleep you didn't even know about? Let's find out, you know? Um, so 
that's that's how I approach things in higher. There's more. We do prizes every month. Nikes, Lulus, um, all of my favorite products and foods to keep you motivated to keep those habits up. We do three Zoom calls a week, so you get support. We have a private Facebook group. We're all vibing and and cheering each other along the way. We get raw and real and honest, and it's just yeah, it's like. I created my life and I created my life the way I like and I like to deep dive with a bunch of bad A people that really want to optimize their lives and it's an honor for me to serve them in that. Um, so I just thought I would tell you about it because I don't know if I talk about it quite enough. So if you're looking for that, if you're like wanting the next level in your body and also in your life, truly, that's what we're doing. So. Uh, seeking bad A's <laughs> to join higher. I do have some spots open. Um, it is limited. I can only handle so many clients at a time, but if you would like to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can go to my website, taragarrison.com and you can request a call and we can see if, if it's a great fit for you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you guys about higher so you could get a little glimpse into what I'm doing on the daily. And if you're looking for something a little more self-guided, I do have my keto in and out program, um, on my website. Website. So you can either do a small taste and try it for eight weeks or you can go a full year. That baby is comprehensive. There is a video of every recipe, video of every exercise. There's a 60 day course teaching you how to do keto or 30 days of keto and then 30 days of bringing back the carbs, FAQ video library, Facebook group, like all of that. So if you're more of like the self guided person and you just want stuff planned for you, um, that is also an option on my website. It's taragarrison.com. I'll link it all in the show notes. And all right, we'll go ahead and get into our episode. Okay, so modern modern N. I'm I'm working on the name pronunciation. I, I love it. I'm thank you for <laughs> teaching me. Um we you know, we spoke a little bit before we started and I was talking about your book, The Stressless Brain. I was thinking about the, that title and I was like, I wonder how many people even believe that's possible <laughs> right now in the yeah. world. Yeah. And so go start, you know, coming back and, and your experience as a, a therapist and also your experience with yoga and meditation and breath, you know, like what, what was it that led you to write that book? Um, so yeah, two things. One is there's a good reason why I call it the stressless brain and not the stressless mind, because it's hard to have a stressless mind, mm. but it is possible to have a stressless brain mm. because brain is the organ yeah. The brain doesn't have attachment and thinking and feelings. That's our mind. Mm. So, but again, if the brain, the amygdala gets triggered, then we get in fight, flight and freeze. And then that connects to the, the mind and all our feelings and thoughts and what's real yeah. and what's not real. So um, the reason why I wrote this book is I've been a therapist for over 20 years and I'm, I love learning. I love learning new models, new interventions, new theories. It just, it helps me be a better therapist. It helps me be a better person. When yeah. I was in college, I made up a sentence back in the early nineties that every day I become a little less stupider. <laughs> which is an incorrect sentence, but it was right. kind of the point yeah. that we never, never stop learning. And um, so I'm always reading, I'm always taking courses or checking things out. And I, I realized about, you know, about 10 years plus ago that there was really great books out there and self-help but they were really focused on empathy and sympathy. And you would read the book and be like, oh yeah, they totally get how I feel. Okay, great, I'm not alone. Okay, great, I, I'm feeling validated. And then I would finish the book and be like, okay, but now what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like the section of the tools and what to actually do on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis was so small or it was really confusing to even know what they were asking me to do. Mm. And so I was like, God, self-help books need to have more concrete tools that are just really just like, like a formula. You do this and this and this, and this is how you do it. And then I threw in a little bit of science and psychology to help demystify, you know, the woo-woo-ness of meditation and chanting and breath. But really I wanted to give people tools so that they could be like, okay, I can empower myself. Okay. I can experience my awareness. Okay. I can grow and change. 
So, yes. Okay. So, so I guess I'm asking for the, the cliff's notes, uh, with an audience of the book, but you know, it's like, okay, don't dangle the carrot in front of us. Like what, what do you perceive as these strategies that someone can do? Um, where do you, where do you start them with, with this process? Well, you know, in therapy, people go to therapy to, to help themselves. They go to therapy to feel, to change, to heal, to work on things that are difficult, challenging, and traumatic. And, you know, they come in once a week for this tiny little, like 50 minutes or an hour, an hour and a half. And then you go home and you're spending your time at home. By prescribing meditation to them, I I say to them, like, you know, the healing, the changing process happens outside of this room. I usually don't get to see the cathartic aha moment or the change or the little, you know, changes that happen weekly, daily, hourly, minute, and you get to see it. I don't. So by meditating outside of therapy, you're able to continue that journey of self-awareness, that journey of what does healing mean for me? The journey of what is it, you know, like how do I process my thinking? How do these lenses come in? And then you come to therapy and then we process it and we go deeper and I have interventions and such. But the meditation is really a way to create a more conscious awareness of who am I, the past, the present and my purpose, which is future. Yeah. Beautiful. I, it's funny timing. Cause I just had the most amazing call with my clients right before this. And one of them uh, so beautiful. She was her, um, accountability for the week had been to extend her meditation time. And she just went off about how she could feel her old, more manic self just in a week's time of extending her meditation time longer, her old manic self, like just saying goodbye to her, like just Mm. feeling her kind of coming back and wanting to be like, no, 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 we are in go mode all the time. And she's like, "Mm -mm, sorry, Mm. like that's not necessary anymore. And she's like, I just feel this tremendous amount of peace. Like I am just completely creating my life and I can see everything that needs to happen. She's like, I feel like this pillar in the middle of a storm. And I thought that Mm. was such a beautiful way of putting it. Cause that's also, you know, I think when you meditate regularly, you, you, prefer to go into that space throughout your day, you know? So before this podcast, for example, like I wanted to be in silence. I didn't Mm -hmm. want, I'm not checking my phone. I don't want anything incoming. I wanted to get grounded into my breath and space. And so I love meditation so much, but what I find, and this is my next question for you. What I find is when I, you know, introduce clients to meditation or I say like, okay, you know, I talk about it on social media. They, (laughs) the reaction is usually like, okay, so like, what do I do? What is it? What, you know? And I think that's such a barrier to meditation because people try it. They have, they don't even really understand it. And so Mm -hmm. they try it and they're like, well, that was pointless. And so they just Mm -hmm. never do it again. So, you know, I'm really interested in your approach of meditation with the chanting, with the breath. Can you describe Mm -hmm. that a little bit more for us? Yes. First thing I hear that all the time too. people like doctors. Now, a lot of doctors tell their patients, you need to meditate. And then they send them out the door yeah. and they're and the patient's like, uh, okay, what, or, I don't know. Like I get an app or I, you know, right. what do I do? And so I, I get that as well. And so the things that I do in the meditations, it's, it's Kundalini meditations and there's, so there's, there's silent and there's chanting and the Um, the silent ones is breathing. There is a form of breathing. You're not just sitting there quietly, which is more the transcendental meditation. You sit in silence and you, you watch your thoughts and you're trying to lessen your thoughts and you're trying to be in that stillness. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm a psychotherapist. So I get, I always tease people when you don't need me, you need me when you love me and like me, you don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's, it's that piece of, um, that people who are having issues, sometimes sitting quietly, it can create the symptoms they're trying to escape. Mm -hmm. And there's a word for it's called relaxation, relaxation induced anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about the meditations that I teach and that I practice myself is you're busy. And, and the mind, remember earlier, the mind and the brain. So the mind needs a purpose. And if we don't cultivate the mind, if we don't harness the mind, if we don't teach the mind, 
again, I didn't say control because we can't control the mind because that's like controlling a ruly child or, yeah. or a ruly, Baker. you know, yeah. yeah, like people often in the yoga world would call it the monkey mind and it's all yeah. over the place and we can't yeah. control it, but, or, and we can harness it and we can teach it and we can mold it. And so in the meditations that I teach, like in the breath ones, you're focusing on a breath pattern. If it's inhaling slowly and you're listening to a chant and you're bringing your eye focus to your brow point, which is the Ajna center, which is intuition. Scientifically, it's bringing your awareness to your pituitary gland. When you activate the pituitary gland, it helps to regulate our hormones. It's the frontal lobe. It helps to calm us. It increases gray matter and, and GABA amino acid from meditation. So you're doing that on the inhale, you're hearing the chant sat, which is my beginner's med meditation. And then when you're exhaling, you're again, you're holding the focus, the eye focus, your hands are in Dhyan Mudra, which is the, the seal of knowledge. And you're exhaling on Nam, which means identity. And so you're, that's a really simple one, but you have music playing. And then eventually you could even do without the music and you would just, in your head, you're inhaling sat exhaling nam. If you don't want to use the Sanskrit words, you can just say inhaling truth, exhaling identity. And so that's a really simple one, but it can go to really complex where you're inhaling in eight counts and exhaling in eight counts, which looks like this. So this is the eight, eight segmented breath meditation. It stimulates the vagus nerve. So the yogis believe is that by pulsing this breath, you're stimulating the lungs, which holds grief and sadness. The science believes that any kind of pattern, pattern or rhythm stimulates the vagus nerve. And when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you actually can relax your body from the inside out. And inflammation can be lowered and decreased by stimulating the vagus nerve. And there is actually a scientific, they create this little machine that they implant in you that you push a button and it stimulates your vagus nerve. I'm like, no, don't do that. Just do segmented breathing, which ironically now I see popping up on different social media. I'm like, oh, I know that. But it's just that that's in, in the vagus nerve is in the center of your chest and it connects to all your organs and glands except for your adrenals. And the reason why is because your adrenals are the fight or flight and we don't want that shut off. We want that to be relaxed, but alert. But you do want the rest, like maybe we talked about the brain. We want the brain to be relaxed so that the mind can be harnessed and be alert. And then the, the chanting, you know, a lot of people get, oh, I'm uncomfortable with chanting. It's different, it's weird. But the thing is most people who start practicing it end up loving chanting meditations over the breath meditations because it's really heart opening and it's very healing and it's good for focus. Go ahead. Can you give us an example of what a chanting meditation would sound like? Yeah, so there's one that's, it's a meditation called removing inner conflict and you bring your hands into Venus lock which um, balances the polarities of the mind. You bring your, your hands into Venus lock at the heart and your eyes are closed and you're chanting hummy hum brahm hum like this. Hummy hum brahm hum. Hummy hum brahm hum. So you can do it by yourself or you can do it with the music in my book. The Stressless Brain comes with 37 free digital downloads. So you get all the music with it. But I do encourage people to practice it, you know, with their own voice. And there's science behind why that's important. Um, uh, thank you for that. And I just have to say, I'm sure my audience is as well, but I'm so enjoying your blending of spirituality and science. That is definitely, definitely my approach. I I often say like, oh, it's so fun when science starts to catch up with spirituality. I say the same. <laughs> I'm like, yay! <laughs> yeah, because there's so many people like need that. And I, I agree. I, I also can be a skeptic. You know, I, I was in a religion for so long that when people are like, hey, this is how it works. There's multiple yeah. lives. And then these aliens come and they're watching. It. I'm just like, okay. I'm like, um, until it feels really true for me. And I see some yeah. sort of like, the way I see it is like spirituality and science are like the two witnesses. And when they start agreeing, it's, it's like, okay, like we've got something here. 
But what truly, you know, take a deep breath, for example, has been a phrase for who knows how long. And now we have like breath experts. So they're like, oh, you have parasympathetic nerve receptors in your lower lungs. And, you yeah. know? So we're like catching up. But it's like, well, people have kind of known that forever intuitively. And I love, thank you for sharing the, um, the, the um, chanting. It made me think of uh, Nikola Tesla's quote that I'm sure you're familiar with. I had to pull it up. Um, and he said, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. Mm-hmm. And so you can hear that, that the vibration mm-hmm. that comes from the chanting mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, the, it's, it's beautiful. The ancient wisdom, I guess, that is coming into something that we're kind of starting to understand a little bit more scientifically. Um, do you, do you know more about that, about like the vibrational energy? Yeah. Well, there's a lot. So there's a lot of research that really backs up chanting. And, and so first thing first, chanting is not a new concept. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years, including the Western culture. We just called it singing in hymns or talking yeah. in tongues or um, going to church and the whole congregation would read the Bible out loud. Right. That's chanting. Yeah. The thing is, is that religion, unfortunately, once you start having power and money, it gets yep. corrupted with sex and manipulation. And, and that's why religion's not doing very well these days. Yeah. Chanting, it, it is, it's, a, it's an energy force. And I mean, I think it's why, you know, people love music. It's not just spiritual music or religious music, but I think, you know, I have two sons and, and they, my older son loves rap. I don't quite get it, but I was a big metal head back in the late eighties and ni- early nineties. So, but my parents were like, what the heck you know? Like, really? You know? And I was like, yes, I loved it, but there's an energy. But the thing with chanting is, is that there's a couple of things. One, when you chant with no music, just your own voice, even if you're singing in the car, when the sound comes, this is scientifically proven, when the sound comes out of your mouth, it goes into your eardrum, into your ear, bounces on your eardrum, hits your hypothalamus and connects to the pituitary frontal lobe area. And it naturally calms you. Mm. So, so like when you hear people like, oh, when I'm really upset, I'll go in my room and I'll put on the music and I'll dance and I sing and they feel better. Well, there's a lot of other stuff happening, but one of the things is that it's the music that, you know, that's affecting the brain. That's one. Second is that our mind, excuse me, our brain and our body are made of mostly water. So music, like you were saying, it's a vibration, it's a currency and and you're, it's it's like a tuning fork and you're going like you hit it and you go ding and it vibrates. But when the vibration relaxes or stops, it's not like it just stops instantly. It slows down and that's what your brain's doing. So third, another scientific research that was done in a research study in, I think it was Sweden, but it's one of the Scandinavian countries. It's in my book. And they did research with chanting, singing in hymns, talking in tongues, reading the Bible. And they found that in all these individuals in the study, that all those processes help to increase the white matter in the upper partial part of the brain. And white matter helps us to emotionally process our life. So the Mm -hmm. more white matter we have, the more aware we are to be able to look at our life in more response and curiosity and compassion rather than judgment and fear and, and fight and flight. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. A friend of mine was, she had gone and done some, she has a lot of anxiety and depressive type symptoms and she had gone to the Amen clinics, um, and found out they, they told her that she had a overactive amygdala. Right. And so, um, in the research that you have, are you, so you're, are you seeing that both the, the breath and the meditation or all three, the breath meditation and the chanting, do they have an, all have an effect on the amygdala? Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing is the amygdala is that animal part of us. It's the fight, flight, and freeze. It, it has no emotion. It has no, Sorry, it has no process of being able to say if something is right or wrong, good or bad. That's not the amygdala. The amygdala, if you go in through your, you have two of them. You go in through your eye, in through your nose, and if, excuse me, you're into your ear and into your eye, and you were to connect in your brain, there's a little amygdala, and there's two of them. 
And their purpose is to keep you alive. It's, it's, it's been around from, you know, centuries. Mm -hmm. It's the mind, it's, it's the mind and how we decipher our life Mm. that will trigger the amygdala falsely. Wow. So it'd be like a false alarm. Now it gets more complicated. The mind and these lenses that pop in and out and how we look at our life is going to be immediately impacted by your childhood events. Yeah. And your parents and your ancestors events. Like science has found now that you can pass trauma through your DNA. Yeah. So, so what you can't change the amygdala. You don't want to change the amygdala. You want the amygdala to be the, to be the amygdala. But what you do want to do is you want to change the other parts of the brain more than mind on how you view life. So when something happens, like your friend, if something happens, bam and she's feeling anxious, if she can practice to stop, count to three and be like, okay, what just happened? What's the reality, the facts versus what do I make up in my mind? Mm. And try to differ, and it just takes time. Once you can start to differentiate facts from made up in my mind, yeah. you'll be able to be, you'll be less anxious because you're like, oh, that's, I'm just making that up in my mind. That's just me, my old, that's my old lens. Right. Now, the way meditation comes in, is when you practice daily, which I'm a huge, huge supporter in, because it's about changing that channel every morning and being in the frequency you want to operate for the day. Mm-hmm. When you meditate every day, and like your client was saying that she upped her time, because what happens is we get used to, if we're doing three minutes every day, we get used to that and we get to like a stalemate. Mm-hmm. We got to up it again to Uh-oh. create to create <laughs> that shift. Interesting. I've been doing 10, just 10 little minutes for like three years. <laughs> so maybe, you go, but maybe you go to like 13 or 12 yeah. or 11. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like a huge thing, but, but the other piece is, is that when you're chanting in your meditation for your 10 minutes or your three minutes or your 20 minutes, whatever it is, when you're chanting, you, you're done, you go on with your day, you have your coffee, you go make breakfast, you get the kids ready or go to work. When a trigger happens, if you can have, you keep building that awareness, you just recite your mantra out loud or silently. And it brings that frequency in and you're less reactive. And mm-hmm. over time, you learn to have different responses in life, which means you're changing that lens. Hmm. Wow. So maybe the lens was like so thick, and then over time, it just gets thinner and thinner and you're more in focus, more in focus, more in focus. I love this. This is why I'm a, I'm a big fan of the work of Byron Katie. I work with one of her coaches yeah. and have for many years and it's, it's questioning your stories, right? And, they're, and they always root back in your childhood. One of my favorite questions she asks is, when was the first time you remember feeling like that? <laughs> that is a huge, huge, juicy <laughs> question, you know? Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, if, if that you listeners aren't familiar, it's asking, questioning your thoughts. Like, is that mm-hmm. true? You know, um, who would I be without that thought? Mm-hmm. That has helped me so much. And mm-hmm. being able to, it's, you know, we, we, we aren't raised and taught that we can actually choose our thoughts, you know, and we actually never really question why we think the way we do. We're just right all the time. Yeah. We're just yeah. right. <laughs> and it's, it's so freeing. I think that when meditation comes in and you, you have that space, to be the observer of your thoughts instead of just in them. It's so huge. Um, okay. So, um, I wanted to dive a little bit more into like, more like I, we go all the way spiritual in this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious. Let's, let's bit, go woo woo. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's go woo woo. So like what, what, where did that path take you? I feel like there's more underneath the surface here. Like you, yes, you have your therapist license and, you know, kind of sort of Western side, but like, where did you get this spiritual side? How did this happen? So I was raised in a ashram and born wow. in, in Holland, Germany, excuse me, Holland. And then we moved to Germany when I was three and a half. So I grew up in the, oh my gosh, I'm glad of, I asked. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> I grew up in the super woo woo. It couldn't get more woo woo. Uh-huh. Some parts are so beautiful and amazing and super popular these days. I always giggle when I see things that were part of my life for 
you know, almost 50 years that are not like, like cold showers are a hit thing right now. It's called hydrotherapy. And I hear about, I'm like, oh yeah, I've known about that my whole life. Golden milk. My mom used to make that back in the seventies. I'm like, now it's, you can get it at Starbucks sometimes, or it's just crazy. So, so there's some beauty from my very strange upbringing, but there's also a lot of pain. Like I was saying earlier, when you start having you know religion and ways of life you just start getting power and money and it gets corrupt so it's a bit of a there's a cult-like history of my upbringing and you I think you and I resonate yeah you and I were like yeah I can see it in your eye oh yeah I was raised Mormon and it was definitely that way kind of all encompassing don't question this is how you think this is how you feel this is how you believe but yeah um, so wait, so that's, so you, what you're saying is you learn so many of these beautiful practices from like wisdom. And that's where I think it, I, that's where religion bugs me is when it comes from, here's some really cool things that we as human beings have learned, have been helpful for us when that flips over to, this is how you should, and that's yeah. how you should do it. And then the, these are the rules. And well, you know, you know it, it's God, you know, I'm always analyzing this being the therapist and my own experiences, but yeah. it's human nature to want to understand why is something the way it is and and a hundred years ago we didn't questions humans didn't questions the question the way we do now mm-hmm. and and I think that that's why religion's probably not doing very well in popularity these days is because yeah. there is it's too dogmatic right. but it's not just religion it, it's anything when you start believing oh this is the only way all of a sudden you're in a box yep and, and it, it reminds me of this quote by um, a grandfather therapist, Jay Haley, who said, the minute you diagnose a person, your thought process stops. Oof, I love that. Yeah. So oh. I've been a therapist for, like I said, over 20 years, and I rarely diagnose unless I have to give someone, only when I give someone, and I give them the most benign diagnosis possible, because I don't want to just say, oh, this person has this issue. Right. And that's what happens in religion. They get very like, they pathologize. Mm. If you're unhappy, it must mean that you did X. Right. And then they just get stuck on that path. Right. And it's like, no, you know, like we are, we're human beings that can evolve and we're supposed to question. And that's why yeah. I tell people, you try something three times. The first time you're going to be skeptical, which right. is a natural reaction. It's healthy. Yeah. That's, it's healthy to be skeptical. Second time, you're, you're a little bit more curious. Mm. And the third time you actually can experience it and then judge it, mm. then say, okay, right. this here and here, now I experience, what's my takeaway? How did it make me feel emotionally, physically, spiritually? How did it make me feel about myself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the same, like, you know, like, yes, religion's not doing very well, but we have, like, you can throw a stone and you, 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 um, you know, hit like a spiritual person is trying to in, you know, empower others, which is great. Mm -hmm. But again, my big thing is learn technology, learn tools to enhance the greatness that you already are. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. A hundred percent. That's, that's, that's in in my experience, you know, as a coach, it's an interesting place to be. And I'm sure as a therapist too, because people come to you with these like eager, like, fix me. Like you have all the answers. And I'm constantly like, no, my job is to ask you really good questions and get you thinking and turn it back into you and turn it back into you. I, I, we're so aligned because I get, I, I get a little heated about dogma and like the nutrition and training world. It's this, like, it's similar to religion. Honestly, it's like, I have the right way and like, come be my followers and be my, you know, I'll be your cult leader. And, yeah. um, yeah. if you start feeling bad, it's not the, my approach's fault is your fault. You must be doing it wrong or, you know, and it's yeah. like, Oh, it makes me want to like freaking rip somebody's face off. Oh, <laughs> I get I so know. mad. I'm like, stop like brainwashing just to help, you know, but yeah. Um, anyway, I, 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 I love this approach of what you said about not diagnosing. Um, I have found that to be, I've, I can't tell you how many people have come to me. Um, we, we dive deep in my coaching. We look at like neurotransmitters and blood work and hair mm-hmm. mineral analysis. And I'm just trying to find clues that, you know, okay, okay. You're magnesium deficient and mm-hmm. you've got this genetic predisposition disposition to be low in dopamine. And okay. So anyway, we look at it, but I can't tell you how many people come to me. And they're like, well, I'm on basically an amphetamine I'm on, you know, whatever upper, um, because I have ADHD. 
Yeah. Right. It's very popular right now. Everyone has it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I, mean, I don't believe that, but that's what's happening. Well, I know. I'm. That's why I always say, I'm like, I don't really believe personally. I don't really believe in ADHD. I'm like, what is actually going on with you? How about that? Like what, what's wrong? Like what's, is it a chemical thing? Is it a spiritual thing? Is it trauma you haven't dealt with? Like, mm-hmm. you know, and symptoms. So, yeah. yeah. So I appreciate you like diving deeper and having this holistic approach too, of like, actually being able to heal yourself from the inside out through the spiritual and the, and the chemical, you know, chemical, I'm curious what you do more on the, you know, you talk about the brain versus just the mind. Can you talk a little bit more? Is it mostly that you are calming and then like basically enhancing the brain through the meditative practices? Well, when I say brain, I'm, I'm in a lot of ways, I'm talking about our, um, our glands. So it's the adrenals, the pineal, the pituitary, and our thyroid. So when I talk about the brain, you know, the brain is the mass computer, but it, it's, it's our glands that really affect how we act and react in life. So, so like, like, you know, if we're having a little, like if you have that little experience of like (gasps) anxiety or scared or anger or whatever it is, it's, it's your glands that's releasing the hormone that create, you know, that's, do I engage? Do I freeze? Do I shut down? And then of course it's it's impacted by the lens of our past, but, um, Kundalini meditation and yoga works on our gland specifically. It works like you were saying earlier, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, but it's, it's our glands that we really want to help because so many people have gland issues. And, and, you know, like, I don't even, like, I rarely hear anything about the pineal gland and it's such an important gland. Like y- yogically, the philosophy is the pineal gland. It's a, it's the gland on top of your brain inside. It's a, it looks like an acorn. It's a little small acorn. And what I understand scientifically biology, it, it's, it helps to regulate our emotions and our hormones. Now in the spiritual realm and the yogic technology, they say that the pineal gland is that part of us that helps us feel connected to something higher than ourself. So higher power, you want to call God, Muhammad, Jesus, I don't care, the sun, the moon, you, you know, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But it, it is, I have found important to be able to find something you can connect to. And here's the, the thing that you can't hear, see and touch. Because humans will let you down. It's human nature. It's yeah. I, I wish it was different. I mean, I have two sons and I have tried my best to be the greatest mother and I have screwed up. I yeah. have hurt them. I have disappointed them because I'm human because right. I, I have a bad day because I, right. I snap because I say no to things that they want. Right. So, so there is that piece. So the pineal gland is this part of us that the yogis believe it's, it helps us to feel connected. Now feeling connected to higher power also gives a person hope. And when we're yeah. struggling and we don't have any hope, then we get really depressed. I mean, that's yeah. when we get really down and you can be eating and drinking and doing every therapy and every meditation in the world. But if your pineal gland isn't functioning well, you're just going to feel like I can't get myself off of the ground. Now, this is a little bit on the woo-woo-ness still from what I understand. And, and I've read this, but some people disagree. And, you know, there's two camps is that there are certain things in our environment that affect the pineal gland, like fluoride and fluoride's a big yeah, push. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. But it, it's from what I understand is that fluoride slowly is eroding our pineal gland. Yeah. That's what I and, heard. Yeah. And people look at me like I'm crazy and I'm just like, but then you look around how many people don't have hope. Like it, I mean, I can't, again, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, putting right. two things oh, together. I'm with you. <laughs> I've had the same thoughts and that I truly like, I think about this exactly what you're saying often, because I, I know deep inside me, like that I am, I am happy. Like I, like I feel this sense of like, I go outside and go for a walk and I'm just like filled with like, I don't know, meaning and purpose and love and, um, depth and, 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 and it is that connection to, I don't know what it is. I, it makes me happy to say, I don't know. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm honestly like, and neither do any of you, <laughs> but there's lots of people who will tell you that they know what it is. And if it feels, if it feels like 
God or Muhammad or like aliens or spirit guides or your higher self or whatever. I don't care. I just hear the same. I'm like, whatever they're talking, whatever word they're using, I know they're talking about that same thing that I feel. And I think so many of us, like either that was never nurtured in us or there was a wound there. I've seen that, you know, I have a lot of friends who also like left a religion and they just like cut that off. They're like, that's all fake. That's all BS. Like, I'm just, you know, going to go straight. And it's like, Ooh, it leads to so much unhappiness. Well, here's the thing is I tell people don't, you know, it's an old expression. I'm not making this up. I know you've heard it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, right. They're, humans by nature are seeking. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, like, if you look at an infant or even an animal, like your pet, if they're feeling upset, what do they do? They come and find you and they, like, I have cats. I love cats mm-hmm. and I have two of them and they come yeah. and they'll, they'll snuggle or, or they'll do this. And that they say, that's what they yeah. used to do with their mothers. And it helps them feel secure. Children will come to you. They may not know how to say, Hey, I need a hug. I'm feeling insecure, but they'll come and push, you know, kind of shove you or they'll do something to, tr- cause they don't know how. Yeah. And so when my kids were little and they would be having meltdowns, I would say to them, okay, what do you need? Are you hungry? Do you need to take a nap? Do you need a hug? Right. Do you, do you need to go poop? Because yeah. that's yeah. gut and mind. Right? right. So, and then over time they learn, I can self soothe, but kids don't know how until right. us parents teach them. Right. But that's the same with adults. When we're looking for happiness and fulfillment and what's my meaning, mm-hmm. we gravitate, you know, gravitate mm-hmm. towards religion or, you know, people to follow. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the big thing is, again, first you're skeptical, then you're curious, then you experience, and then you evaluate, stop mm-hmm. and evaluate. Okay. I left this religion. They're crazy. Okay. That's one, maybe there's some truth to that. And what did I like? Was there any part of this experience that brought me into it or that my mom or my dad talked about? And maybe it's love thy neighbor. And I really like that concept. Or maybe it's, you know, meditating. Like for me, it's meditation. I, I'd left a lot of the other stuff, but I'm like, no, I really love meditating. I love chanting. It, it heals me. Mm-hmm. And that's when you can differentiate what am I taking in? And you open your heart bring it in. And what do you say? No, thank you. And I, I, this is such a needed message right now. When you were describing that little kid going or the cat or the little kid going to mom for help because they don't know what's wrong. They don't know what's wrong. I had this like visual of this little kid standing there crying and can't find anybody to help them. And they don't even know what's wrong. And I'm like, it just, I think of how many adults feel like that, like in oh, so deep many. internally, they're just like, I don't even know what's freaking wrong. I don't even know. And so they go to all these gurus, you know, they go to social media, they go to books, they go to us, yeah. they go to everybody. Yeah. And I, I, for me, that that's why I've incorporated meditation into my, into my uh, company, because I'm like, I'm tired of seeing everybody at their, the end of their rope in this frenzy of search for help because they don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, you can, you can get that answer for yourself from source energy. So even though I only technically meditate in the morning, sitting here, like silent and, you know, doing regular, I do go in nature a ton in silence almost every day for at least an hour. (laughs) Like I walk around the lake uh, um, by my house and I just go in silence Mm -hmm. and just let, sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes nothing comes in it's and just that's okay pure. that's actually kind of a bonus <laughs> it is it's great but sometimes what happens is I get taught it's like a, it's like a mother that's why I love mother nature so much because she is like a mother to me I get taught it's like hey it's like this loving like hey Tara like look at it this way or you know oh ooh. it's just this course correction you know yeah. and I think that's available to all of us like we don't have to stand there like this little lost kid crying because we don't know what's wrong like we have that available to us all the time yeah so I appreciate yeah. that yeah and that's- I think you know part of it is it's um it's it's about finding the you know the people who can be your teachers and then you learn yeah. to be your own teacher so it's not yeah. about attaching and hooking Right. Because that's why religion and all, you know, even businesses get so corrupt is we get so like, okay, I, I keep needing you to empower me. And it's like, yeah. no, you, you, you experience it, but then 
you got to make it your own. You got to self-initiate your own healing, your own process. Once you've had the support. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for um, saying that. I'm like, wait, well, I do have like a mindset coach and a clarity coach and a, <laughs> a therapist. I'm going through one of her courses right now. So yeah, like seeking out um, good excellent teachers is mm-hmm. obviously super important and, and therapists as well. And I love that. I'm, I'm glad that I met you so that I have like a resource to send people to, because I, I will be honest, like I struggle sometimes from what I hear from people's stories with their therapists. I'm like, yeah, like they just put you on a medication and that's it. Like, mm-hmm. holy cow. Like, you know, and so it's nice to have resources of people who are combining yeah. the spiritual and, you know, all approaches. It's like, yeah. what and, I hear from you is like, I just want you to feel better. So whatever that yeah. takes, I'm into yeah, and it. I have some clients who go on medication maybe for yeah. six months and then they go off. I mean, like, that's the thing is, you know, I'm not anti-medical. I'm not anti-medication. Right. It's just, there's a time and place yeah but it's, it's not a crutch. It's, it's a tool to then get you to yourself and then you let it go and you see, can I continue that? What did I learn? And it really is about holding yourself accountable. And we, we get lazy as humans. I hate to say it, but we kind of are lazy human beings a lot. Yeah. And, and it's about showing up and doing the work and there is some level of sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Ex- excellent point. And I love that you've included these meditations in with the purchase of your book. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows to get to purchase your book. Where do you recommend they go? Well, of course you can go to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and so forth. But if you go to my website, modernand.com, they, I, my price is way cheaper than anywhere else. And I have audio, digital, hardcover, soft cover, and I ship free shipping anywhere in the U S and then I do a special deal for out of, out of the country. And then, awesome. So, okay. yeah. Can you spell that? We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Really, so it's, I know it my, my name is difficult. It's, so it's, it's M A D H U R N A I N.com. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Oh man. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this with us today. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that, you know, you would like to just share if you're not, you have a mic that you would yeah. like to share with people that's in your heart? Um, well, I always like to say this one of my most favorite quotes, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who it is. It was someone back in the sixties who said this, and it's, it's not the life you live. It's the courage you bring to it. Hmm. And so I often, you know, leave that with people and my clients, it's just a a sense of, we get so stuck in like what I should have or could have or need. And it's like, okay, that is part of life. Like I'm not against materialistic things. I get it. I love my, my own things I like, but it's really about like, what's the courage that I, you know, I reach deep inside of me to get through something because you can tap into that each time. And that's the story. It's not, it's not the, what you achieved or what you got. It's, it's the process of how you went through something. Yeah. And I think that's courage. Yes. Some, so much of what I've experienced as courage in my life is when my intuition is telling me something and it's usually when it's telling me to let go of something I'm really attached to that takes a tremendous amount of courage. Um, also facing this, you know, that you have the, we, I have these stories that, well, if I do that, people will react like this, you know, yeah. and that can keep you I, many times in my life that has kept me stuck. And it's, I've just learned that the quicker I have the courage to just trust it and listen to it and act on it, the better my life gets like mm-hmm. way faster. It's gentle. It's like, you don't have to listen. We're trying to help you, but you can keep staying attached to your things if you'd like, you know? So mm-hmm. I think so much of courage comes from this inner place that you really tap into more when you meditate, you know, yeah. when you are willing to go inside and do your inner work and mm-hmm. see your shadows. You know, I think leaving religion definitely helps you see that you can be so sure. You can be so right. You can be like, there is no other possible way that anything else is true with this. I'm freaking attached to it. Like, (laughs) and when that, when you find out you weren't, 
Like it yeah. definitely changes. It, it almost makes you excited to want to be wrong about things <laughs> and have the courage to act on them. Because at least for me, I felt like my life got so much happier, so much yeah. more free, you know? So I, I, love I mean, that. it is, you know, for some people, you know, I, I work with people who are very stuck. They're in really toxic relationships or toxic jobs or situations. And, and it, you know, I can't just say you need to leave, but I often will say to them, what's the worst that could happen in this situation? And then they'll think about it and then they'll answer it. And I'll say, sometimes you won't leave until that happens. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that's enough of a like, oh God, I don't want that to happen. And then sometimes they'll make a change then, or sometimes they have to wait till the worst possible thing. And then the change happens. Yeah. hundred percent. I've had my rock bottoms. That is hundred percent true. Sometimes I, I, I call my rock bottom, my, uh, body slam from the universe. Like wake up girl, wake up. <laughs> you know, I like that. It, it was based in love, but I freaking, I was so locked yeah. in my patterns. It was like, I was not seeing any way out. So sometimes we have to kind of lose it all or yeah. we could just start doing the work earlier and tapping in and trusting ourselves and listening yeah. to what that voice is telling us. It's been telling us for quite mm -hmm. a while, you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. It was so amazing meeting you. And um, again, we will put all the links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes on YouTube and all the audio platforms. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode as much as I have. Thank you so much.